نحمده ونسلي ونسلم على رسوله الكريم أما بعد One of the side effects or the downside we should say of following the imams or doing taqlid is that one gets a bit limited and the growth stop. We do not question, we just follow. We do not inquire, so we do not get more information and the curiosity tends to lead to more answers and more knowledge and more creativity. We come up with new solutions to many things. Since we stopped doing it, it has become a problem. How do we then go about it? Just remember, in every science, there are certain basic learning and knowledge that has to be had before one tries to inquire about the deeper matters. The trouble is that most Muslims and even non-Muslim in the modern time have become so inquisitive about anything and everything that they stop thinking. They do not ask questions because they think a lot, but they ask questions when it comes to them for whatever reason. Any question that comes to their mind, they would ask without thinking about the need for that question, number one, the intention behind the question, the benefit or advantages of the question and the disadvantages. Certain questions are asked in order to test the knowledge of the one being asked question. Certain questions are asked to show their own knowledge in a group, the people would say, wow, that's a very deep question he asked. Certain questions are asked in order to just pass time. No need, just for the sake of asking. Everyone is asking, let me ask a question as well. Rather, our deen suggests that we should ask questions if there is a benefit with that. If one wants to get some benefit out of it. That is why we do not seek knowledge for the sake of knowledge. We seek knowledge to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would ask dua, would ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahumma anfa'ni bima allamtani, wa'allimni ma yanfa'uni. So he's asking about beneficial knowledge, not just any question and any point that comes to someone's mind. Now if you start studying them formally and become much more qualified or have some stuff, some knowledge inshallah ta'ala, then it is generally encouraged to ask questions and we do ask questions. When we were studying with Ashuyu, and we still do, we ask questions. Our groups are such that people do ask questions day in day out. In fact, Although people claim that there's no leeway or the, the scholars do not allow questions, that's actually not right. What they want is, like the, the laity, that they should be given a freelance allowance to not just question, to inquire, but rather to question the judgment and debate on that, criticize, challenge, and that is what is discouraged until and unless one has achieved a certain level of knowledge. It is like a small boy, they can ask questions, small kids can ask questions, and however silly those questions are, you tend to respond to them. But when they come to a point where they start challenging you, then you can't help them other than asking them to stay quiet, please don't ask them. Not because you do not have answer to them, not because you do not want to respond to their questions, rather the stuff is beyond their comprehension. If you tell them, they wouldn't understand. They need to grow up, they're only 11 or 12, so they need to grow 
to an age where they would be able to understand what you're try trying to tell them. Not every question is beneficial at each level. There are many, many factors that play a significant role and a sensible teacher, sensible person, likewise parents, would only entertain the questions that are beneficial for the family, student, your, your, your child, whoever. So you do not ask any question and every question. And this is completely different to what modern te teachers, what the current world or new world suggests us. They ask anything and everything. They question everything. That is why many of them question and they started questioning a few hundred years ago. Now they're at the point where most of them have lost their faith because people have questions about Allah, about Creator, about everything to the point that nothing would satisfy them unless and until they would see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So questions are important but as long as they are beneficial and done in the context and done with some prior knowledge and studies. Now you want to be a doctor for example, you do not go to a doctor and ask questions about detailed medical issues. You can only ask the problem that you have and no one does that. I'm so surprised by the fact that people are so clear and clued up, they know exactly what to do when it comes to material world. They know what sort of questions they should ask. They know who to ask. They would not go to a gynecologist to ask something about their back or their eye. Rather, they would go to a specific specialist of that particular field and then ask the question within the time that they have allocated for the appointment and they would ask all relevant questions they would not question their judgment even if they disagree they would go for a second opinion they would use all the decorum and propriety respect and honor and they would then behave in such a way that so and when it comes to ulama the questions tend to be anytime to anyone and they need answer and they need it now there's no concept of having time or taking time, which is fine. Alhamdulillah, ulama has always maintained this and they do that. And yet, since the ulama always enjoyed that respect, not because of their personal uh, personalities of their being themselves, but rather because they are the heirs of Prophet wasallam, of all the prophets, and they deserve that respect anyway. So when people were behaving that way, it was completely fine and it's still quite okay. So people say that ulama don't allow question, and I feel that this is completely wrong. If you look at the fatawa compiled by ulama, a true fatawa, those questions are not the frequently asked question that you get on the website that they create. These questions are not asked, they are done in anticipation that those might be the question or they one or two people ask the question they just put that and they call it frequently asked questions and they are, some of them are made up question as you know not, not all the questions have been asked some are asked some are not and even if they ask they ask maybe once and then they just put it there when it comes to fatawa the ulama have done you would find all the muftis have fatawa responded to in thousands handwritten fatawa over the last 150 years, you would find all the big fatawas in big madaris. We're talking about hundreds and thousands of fatawa individually written, individually responded to for free. People ask questions according to their situation. They got, they will get their answer. They get straight away. Well, however long it takes, but without any. In a trouble there at all. So to ask question is not a problem, but you want to go deeper than that, which is to challenge, change the, the status quo, means asking why, not 
how, not what, rather more important for modern people is why. This why is a very important aspect as well, but it only comes after you have done your what and then slowly, slowly your how and then why. We want why before anything else and that is not acceptable in any specialty, in, in, in any field, because it doesn't serve any purpose. If I tell you why I treat a TB patient, tuberculosis, with these medicines, to you if you're not a doctor or not even a medical student, then you know what? I will be wasting my time. I will be wasting your time. And it's not going to be beneficial to you. Unfortunately, some people don't understand that. When I was doing my final year exams, it was two weeks time or three weeks time, the exam is about to start. We would go to different wards, different hospital, medical ward, just to get some knowledge and information. This is, I'm, I'm talking about Dow Medical College, Pakistan. So several hospitals, we went there. On one day, we were told that there'd be very good lesson and lecture from one of the very senior neurologists there. And I, I admired and loved him. Uh, but when we went there, he started talking about a new research review article in neurology, a condition called amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Now this is a subtype of motor neuron disease, a rather less common, and this is talking about 1996, long time ago, and it wasn't that common, it's still not very common, but still there, yet a very, very fine, detailed stuff about a condition which is very rare, and we are talking about medical exam. So we've spent half an hour, and after that, I had to excuse myself, I raised my hand and I said, sir, I'm sorry, but our exam is in two weeks' time. And we are here for medical exam, not neurological exam. So we felt that we might get some benefit for the exam. This topic is not going to come in exam. This is not the topic for final year medical exam. And even if it was four or five minutes worth of review or update would have been enough. But talking about some rare genetic problem with some gene therapy in it is not what we need now. So it is not the right time for this. And I said it to him, unfortunately, I shouldn't have, but I had to and then left that class. He never minded, he was very generous. And uh, I just met him in December, actually, very nice teacher of mine. But I uh, apologize for that. But that was a rude attitude. But I had to, you know, leave that because I felt that I would be wasting my time there. So obviously for him, it was a very important topic but not wasn't right at that time for those people. Yes, maybe for someone very qualified. What I'm trying to say is everyone needs to know everything, <laughs> but we can't know everything in this little time that we have with us. We need to set priorities. I do not know anything about the weed, but I'm more interested in knowing about very detailed fiqhi issue about something else. I'm, I haven't got any clue about the spirituality, but I want to find out what Ibn Arabi rahmatullah, has said about certain things or some other shiuk of the past. So I'm actually wasting my time. I'm just trying to show off with certain big names here and there, and then hoping that people would be taking me seriously and I'll be seen as a big sheikh somewhere. <laughs> That's all problematic. So it has not stopped. And that is why the qualified scholars, when they start working, and they're still working, mashallah, a lot of stuff is coming out. They're deep, mashallah. They are deep in their subjects. They know their bit very well. Very well. So even today, you would find scholars are working and coming up with all the solutions and rulings. Alhamdulillah. Yes, we can always improve. There's always ways to improve things. Yet, 
it is not down to someone who has not even done his basic education become a doctor and then start doing some research but not to start research as a laity and take that as oh it's my right when it comes when it comes to religion it is even more difficult there's so much one needs to learn not to show off but to tell you since 1992 30th october 1992 exact date that is the first day that i sat with a sheikh to study Arabic and from that time to now I can say that there has been no time in my life where I was not studying with a sheikh, a teacher, some book, something, maybe it's during exam for a few weeks here and there but generally I have always been connected to a teacher and still am, still studying under the guidance of teachers. I'm just trying to say, and even then, I don't feel that I have done enough. And I know that I know only this much, very little, maybe 5% of what I should know, or any scholar of that good stature like Sheikh Taqit Mani and, you know, the Shuyukh and Asati that they would have done at this age that, that I am in their time with a lot of blessings and barakah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they were fully dedicated, unlike myself, who is you know, doing medicine and this. So despite those 28 years of life spent with the ulama, on average you would say two hours per day, I feel that I've only acquired 5% of what they know. And it is not being humble, it is just knowing the reality. So how on earth would someone who's not even done the basic Arabic, Tajweed, Fiqh, Hadith, Suluk and Usul al Fiqh, Usul al Hadith, and Usul al Tafsir. How can then they go and claim it? I, I'm, I'm, wallahi, I'm saying that I do not find myself qualified to ask or challenge ulama. I'm talking about the seasoned ulama, senior ulama, those who teach. And yet you would find 15 year old and 20 year old. They've just graduated from madrasa, they've just done some bits, and they feel that they can do something, they can ask questions, they can have their own opinion of certain issues. And it's quite common in modern scholarship, unfortunately, especially in the West. And they, they're all mujtahidun on their own. And they're not even, you know, they're very young in their age as well. They haven't even run a family yet for a good 10, 15 years, and yet they feel that they can run the whole ummah. Stuff in it. May Allah save us from this self deceit which has crept in. I would rather be a, a simple shepherd than to feel that I am knowledgeable, which unfortunately happens a lot with common, modern, secularly educated people and some new ulama, so called graduates from madrasas and universities. They feel that they've done five, six years and they, they've done enough. And they start questioning everything that they read or they heard. And that's because they haven't got a wisdom. Yeah, they may have knowledge, but knowledge on its own is not enough. Iblis had a lot of knowledge, in fact, perhaps more than any one of us altogether. But it didn't help him. So knowledge doesn't save someone if it is not coupled with a sincere heart. Tazkiyah. May Allah give us tawfiq to understand.